as we always say, we love reports. We love these analyst reports. Nigerian analysts, asset managers, they're doing great work. Half year, 2024 begins in earnest. You need to make sure that you have a strategic shift to protect your money and future uh, investments. This is the crux of a new half year 2024 report from Cardinal Stone Partners, appropriately titled At the Precipice of a Strategic Shift. Uh, they've got a review, they've got an outlook, they've got a strategy. We are happy to be joined by Philip Anegbe, CFA, Vice President, Head of Investment Research at Cardinal Stone Partners. Philip, it is good to see you again. You've been a stranger, you've been a busy man, flying around the world, giving investment advice. Great to have you. Good morning. Thank you very much, Rotus. It's always a pleasure to be on the program. Fantastic. Uh, so let us, Philip, let's dive in. Let, let's get into I enjoyed reading this thing over the weekend. I hope everybody downloads it and reads it as well. But um, in, in summary, I've you know, started doing this thing. I'm starting from the last question first. If I to summarize this report, are you essentially saying that global macro trends require a consistent realignment of portfolios? What's the summary of the report? Absolutely. We think that uh, the global economy is a dynamic one. And then to see that your portfolio continues to perform optimally, you have to evolve your strategy. Mm. Uh, for instance, there are expectations for growth across the globe. And those expectations uh, differ depending on uh, who's, who you are reading. Yeah. Right? So uh, there are some uh, that expect uh, some sort of a recessionary uh, risk in the U.S., for instance. Yeah. Uh, for those set of uh, analysts, they'll be telling you to actually go short on equities. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But then there are others who believe that the global economy, including the U.S., will reach a safe landing. And for those kind of analysts, when they overlay uh, expectation of uh, normalization of interest rate, they'll tell you to go long on equities. Yeah. Right? And of course, there is also the consensus on the, in, the, in the fixed income space uh, that uh, global yields may have reached inflection. Mm. And if global risk, uh, 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 rates have reached inflation, then maybe it's time for you to begin to lock in uh, very decent rates because they are not going to be here forever. Exactly. In some countries, we are already seeing the normalization of interest rates. Gotcha. Right. Then you come to the global, the, the, the domestic economy. We think that we are at the precipice, mm. right, of strategic shift. Gotcha. Right. Fixed income yields are very high, probably unsustainable. We had the richest man. Uh, in Nigeria, <laughs> yeah. saying that no yeah. one can create jobs with an uh, interest rate of about 30%. Right, that's right. Right, so there's already pressure. And I think in today's news, uh, there was information that CBN may soon start going slow on the rate increases. We're mm. thinking that in the second half of next year, we, begin, we may begin to see rate cuts. Okay. So what do you do now? Uh -huh. You lock down the rates. Look at your portfolio, uh, in your asset portfolio. Try to lock down the rates. Go long and go big. That's what we said in the report. I like that. I yeah. like that. All right. Lots to get into. Thank you for that. Thank you for giving us a taste. All right. Nigeria now. The widening output gap. I want to start there. Your report goes in, talks about 3% GDP growth for the last three years. Eh, kind of tepid. Saying the output gap remains wide. Weak labor productivity. Outflow of talent, the Jackpot Syndrome, you talked about that. You noted the 260,000 visa applications from Nigerians to leave in 2023 alone, highest number on, uh, on record. Can you talk about the, what is contributing to this year, this issue that we're facing? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, productivity is the issue. Yeah. So productivity is low, and that is actually affecting our, long, uh, our, trend, our growth, essentially. The trend of growth is sort of affected by low productivity. And if you look at the issue uh, very carefully, you realize that the jackpot syndrome we are talking about is only exacerbating it. Yeah. But then you have underlying issues like um, uh, the quality of education. Maybe it's not where it should be, right? You have other issues as security. Security is a big productivity risk in Nigeria. Right. Security uh, adversely affects uh, the agricultural sector, for instance. You know, what is the productivity of a farmer, for instance, that will always have to be watching his back? Right. You know, or maybe did not have a very good sleep for fear of uh, attacks. Right. So what sort of productivity do you expect for such a farmer? Mm. What is the productivity of a uh, physician that lacks uh, the basic uh, infrastructure equipment? So like electricity. electricity. So equipment or infrastructure deficit is also a key problem in productivity. So it's, it's broad ranging, essentially. Yeah. But then productivity is the issue. And until we begin to tackle productivity, we, that's when we're going to see uh, you know, remarkable you, 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 you talk about education and quality of education. I can't stop talking about this guy. This 22-year-old in the UK that's been elected to office I'm, <laughs> blows my mind. He's, he's a, science, a science student at the University of Cambridge. Okay, let me ask you about this. Since we're talking about productivity, that leads me into 
minimum wage. And I like I like the uh, the asset managers that are making bold predictions and giving estimates as to where they think they will land. So you folks think that the minimum wage will the agreements will rest at eighty thousand naira. Of course, deliberations are still there, but you are very welcome to at least give a projection. You're saying it's going to cost government about one point five trillion naira. I've been saying this thing is going to be inflationary, but your report corrected me saying that, um, you know, there, there, there's a weak wage inflation link, right, between the two. So the thing is there, um, can you talk about, can you expand on that, the, the inflationary metric there, and, you know, how we solve this minimum wage issue? Yeah, first, uh, the minimum wage clamor is a consequence of the short-term impact of reforms. Yeah. Right. Obviously, PMS prices are rooftops. AGO is already deregulated, so the prices have been high. And then you have the whole uh, impact of exchange rates, you know, the Naira weakness, sort of actually uh, making a uh, cost of living uh, crisis a thing. Yeah. Right. And that is where the clamor came from. Now, in terms of trying to infer what the cost implication can be for the government, we actually uh, piggybacked on the federal government's uh, uh, statements, more or less they said, uh, the over 400,000 naira minimum wage being advocated for by labor could cost the government about 9.5 trillion. So you only need to do uh, inference, you draw inferences from that uh, to suggest that it, maybe 80,000 could cost the government about 1.5 trillion extra personal expense, right? Uh, we are saying 80,000 looks like a fair amount given that uh, the likes of Edo states are already more or less doing 70,000. Right, so right. maybe they've created some sort of a baseline. Mm or maybe a lower base upon which uh, the federal government can, you know, can, can begin bargaining from. But then we look to see uh, where, what decision they arrived at. But then whatever decision they arrive at must be sustainable, not just for the federal government, not just for the state government, but also for the private sector, because it becomes legally binding. Right. Right? So now in terms of um, uh, inflation, the historically wages and inflation in Nigeria. Yeah. Right, has had very low correlation, maybe because of the way inflation is computed. Right. But then it is what it is. Well, inflation is what the MBS <laughs> yeah. reports, yeah. right? But then the inflation that hits you may be different from the inflation that hits me. <laughs> right. I have my own inflation in my house. I compute it every day, you know, every month. Yeah. You know, my yeah. wife gives me the data that I compute. So yeah. we have different inflation realities. But then we are saying that reported inflation may be a bit, the impact may not be a bit uh, as uh, high as people expect, because probably because of the way it's computed. Fantastic. Uh, let's now get to some really hard-hitting charts in your report. In wages and inflation, that takes me to poverty. Um, and I think we'll just do this one at a time. You've got a, yeah, this was, this was great. So you've estimated here, um, you forecast or looking at, you know, up to, well, we've gone from, from 2016, 70 million Nigerians living below the poverty line to an estimated 92 million uh, by this year and 93.7 by 2025. So that's one. Then we go to the business profitability. Uh, you've got another chart. This is you know very strong chart here. Business profitability slumping to a historic low on tough macro conditions. You've talked about the reforms and what's, what's happened there. Then we've got GDP per capita which uh, your report also shows, yeah, there it is. Great chart showing that falling. And I think so you chronicled the business exits, uh, the number of uh, firms. Yeah, so GlaxoSmithKline, Sanofi, Bolt Food, Jumia Food, Procter Gamble, PZ Cousin. So, Philip, how do we turn all of this around? That's part one of my question. I have part two on the two, 12, two trillion naira stimulus that's been asked. Well, how do we turn all this around? How, how, what's, this is dire. Yeah, absolutely. It's dire stuff. Absolutely. Uh, Short-term pains. I, I remember, I think we came here after the publication of, say, two, three outlooks ago. Right. What we said, uh, I think the title was Biting the Bullet. Right. That's so right. we knew, we saw it coming, right? And we forecasted that there is going to be that initial phase, that transition phase, uh, that businesses and individuals may be pressured. But then you bite the bullet if you want to enjoy the long-term gains. Right. Right. Now, in terms of uh, how to turn it around, we think that uh, because a central issue is FX. Right. You look at uh, uh, the listed companies, I think NGX 30 company, the non-bank in NGX 30 company, about 60% of them reported FX losses. Wow. Some had their shareholders fund completely eroded. Yeah. Right. So FX is a big issue. So we should uh, find ways to sustainably uh, improve the FX markets, liquidity and otherwise. Yeah. Right. One thing we can do is to try to uh, more or less drive organic growth 
of FX inflows. I see organic growth. I didn't say uh, just issuing, issuing euro bonds, diaspora, but I think we should also uh, lean towards organic growth. And how can we achieve that? Uh, I think uh, we can sort the security problems around oil and gas. Yeah. It is not rocket science. I think it can be sorted. Yeah, yeah. It, is, it is determination. It is commitment. You know, it is uh, loyalty to the populace. You know, so we try to sort out security issues around oil and gas and at least take crude production to nearer to 2 million barrels per day. We were at 1.4 million barrels on average last year. Yeah. This year we are doing 1.5. We can't reach that. And it's interesting to note that uh, NMPC have said they are going to more or less uh, take the bull by the horn, yeah. try to drive this initiative. And I think in recent uh, conversations, the uh, representative of the president did hint that they are going to target 2 million barrels per day. I think that organic growth is important, mm. right? Then you can now support those organic growths uh, of FX inflow with other options, right? You want to issue euro bonds, you want to raise the diaspora bond, but then there should be a sound base. And that sound base can only be guaranteed by organic growth of FX. Yeah, yeah. Fundamentals have to be strong. Yeah. And then once fundamentals are strong, it's going to influence how people price your currency. That makes sense. So okay. it does. So essentially, that is one solve the FX issues because that's what is biting most of the listed companies. And there are other businesses that are not, that are not listed. That are facing the same issues. That are facing the same issues. Some yeah. some businesses, some people negotiated right contracts. You know, uh, having uh, X Y Z exchange rate in mind. And but then, three months or two months, three so months down the line, everything scattered. scattered. Yeah. So there has to be a bit more predictability. You know, and I think it's interesting that the CBN is now leaning toward, more towards stability mm. as opposed to a particular level. Right? Stability helps businesses to plan over the long term. Yeah. So contracts you know, will be contracts. Right? Then you've avoided a, a lot of uh, litigation and legal issues when you know, people are unable to fulfill a contract. So FX, very critical. But away from that, I think we should begin to take education seriously. Allocations to education must improve. I did say... Uh, the quality of education can be better, right? Our universities, who do they produce? Mostly people who come out, you know, looking for jobs as right. opposed to producing entrepreneurs. We should produce entrepreneurs yeah. Yeah. and not job seekers. Gotcha. Job seekers that come out maybe, either, and it's all of us really, right? That entitlement, you know, I need, government has to give me a job. We need to transit from that. We need to produce entrepreneurs. People will come out and say, how do I make this happen? How do I employ just one more person? Problem solvers. That's Problem we, solvers, yeah, essentially. Yeah. I think that is important. Yeah. Then, of course, we should do more on infrastructure. I did mention what exactly is the productivity of a farmer that lacks input. Right. It's or low. the productivity of a physician. Right. And that is why many uh, trained professionals are looking for uh, uh, you know, uh, environments where they could you know, they the, will have all the of the Jackpot syndrome. Right? Jackpot syndrome. Yeah. So everything here sort of reinforces the problem. So by the time you attack uh, the issues uh, multifaceted, you know, my, my, on the, from the multidimensional perspective, yeah. then you begin to reach sustainable uh, solutions. Solutions, solutions, so solid. I have to ask you about debt. You've got some more great charts. I really, really enjoy these, 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 these next set of charts on Nigeria's uh, debt since we're talking about how to solve some of these issues because there's going to be a lot of spending that is uh, involved. All right, this was great. Debt flows, everybody was talking about that $24 trillion increase. You dimensioned the fact that 74.6% of that is an impact of adverse FX movements. Then you've got the organic debt increase there showing that a local debt 26.8% and an actual external debt without the FX movement down by 1.4%. Next, I believe, was ways and means. You broke that, was it next? No, yes, it was ways and means. So breakdown of ways and means the total amount, 30.9 trillion. The securitized amount, 22.7. Repayments for the first half of the year. Fantastic, fantastic breakdown. And then I think we had the maturity of debt. Yep. Uh, debt majority composition as a percentage of GDP through um, looking at about peaking about 45% full year. And then uh, debt to GDP ratio uh, is remaining fairly stable in the near term. So another thing, Philip, because I got to one, one more chart here. You also had the credit ratings which suggests, as it says there, the headline, credit rating outlook appear mostly positive in Nigeria. So what is the narrative? Is it that the debt situation is a crisis or based on what the credit um, reports are saying, it is stable? What's, what's the story with our debt? Uh, first, I would say uh, what we typically say in finance yeah. or investment research. That leverage is neutral. Yeah. It's just a multiplier. Leverage in itself is not bad. Debt is not bad. Yeah. It is what you do with debt. Gotcha. So leverage is simply a multiplier. 
if you are doing well, it multiplies your profit. Right. If you're right. doing if you badly, are doing bad, it multiplies your losses. Your losses. So, having said that, yeah. I think that uh, there are standard uh, gauge gauges or measures to ascertain sustainability, debt sustainability. Okay. I think for uh, IMF benchmark, they have debt to GDP, you know, threshold of uh, I think fifty five percent. That's right. That's right. We are just in excess of forty percent. So data suggests that we are not doing badly. Yeah. Data is data. Right. And you, the easiest way to lose an argument is to argue against data. Right. Then they also have um, reserve coverage as another measure, mm. right? Threshold is 100%. Short-term debt must not, must not be in excess of 100% of your reserve. Yeah. Nigeria's is over 50%. So we are still good on that front. Okay. And then you have reforms. Right. You have reforms. You see the uh, outlook uh, for most rating agencies is saying outlook positive. Because outlook positive. Uh, stable, because yeah. They realize, and I think we should realize, mm -hmm. that we were always going to face an initial difficult phase. Right. Right? So give the reforms time. And while we are giving the reform time, so maybe, a time maybe the government on its part should also fast track the provision of safety nets, okay. which includes the minimum wage. And that's why we, are, we think the minimum wage is actually a very productive move. Okay. And it should be closed fast. Yeah. So not extended essentially, forever. Not extended forever, they? exactly. So you, we think that uh, the debt, Nigeria's debt is broadly sustainable, and we are leaning fully or completely to the measures. There are measures for, <laughs> for these things. Right. So it's not random. Yeah. I know people will say um, debt service to revenue, right? But then once you try to encourage that organic growth, right, of FX, Try to boost crude production eventually, yeah, and, and of course, you try to more or less expand the tax nets. Right. You know, there are a lot of initiatives, you know, trying to uh, block illegalities around tax collection, try to uh, improve tax, tax yield, etc. Then, of course, the revenue becomes bigger, mm. and of course, the debt uh, service to revenue then becomes better. Gotcha, gotcha. So, I think a lot has been happening in the last few months, in the last one year, but I think. Uh, whilst we are calling on the government to actually hasten the provision of safety nets, we should also realize that there's a waiting time yeah. to achieve progress. The clock, the clock is ticking. Um, quickly, inflation. Um, a, lot, a number of uh, you know, outlets have been saying they see it peaking. Can you talk? I, mean, I think you've got a chart uh, for inflation. Um, what, what's the, the story here? Do you think, is it what, based on you know, base effects? What's, what's the reason why you think you see uh, inflation, I guess, peaking at? What is it, where, it's, where it is now before country as year on year though um, decelerating. What's the story there? Yeah, we think that uh, inflation may have peaked. Yeah, uh, we and this is uh, uh, supported by the moderations we've seen. I think month to month inflation has moderated for about three months. Yeah, and of course the key driver for the year on year moderation is likely to be a high base effect, and we're likely to see that play out uh, in the second half of the year. But in addition to a uh, high base effects, uh, you see that there's likely to be a pass through from lower AGU uh, prices thanks to Dangote refinery. Yeah, yeah. Right. So there will be a pass through. Even for most uh, listed companies, we expect that um, uh, their energy costs or the profile of their energy costs would improve in the second half. So energy costs for those listed companies are likely to moderate because a lot of them rely on AGU. Mm. Right, and that's so, diesel for those diesel, who are diesel. yeah, yeah, diesel. Yeah. So okay. essentially, um, we expect inflation to moderate year on year. Inflation to moderate in the next half. Okay, it's not to say that the <laughs> it's not to say that uh, if, if prices just are coming down, prices are collapsing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Just for clarity, right? It's to say that uh, the pace of increase will sort of uh, right uh, taper out. So good, good disclaimer there. Good disclaimer. So as you don't go to the market and <laughs> give that. me a bag of rice for ten thousand. I say Philip said that uh, it's going to come. Um, look, money supply, Philip. What? Okay, because this data. Uh, released by the CBN. This is looking at May, year on year, May. I mean, we're almost at a hundred trillion. So, I mean, what about this? If this is, keeps climbing, how do you how do you get inflation to at least on, on this side, this pressure point? What's your view on what we're seeing with money supply? Well, I think that uh, uh, money supply. There's historical research. Yeah, yeah, CBN research that suggests that. Uh, I think data, the data they used was data between uh, from 1970 to about 2020. It suggests that. Uh, money supply accounts for about 50% of inflationary yeah. pressure. Yeah. However, we think that that may have slightly changed. Okay. Uh, and that is because um, uh, we have seen energy, right? the PMS issue, the, following the uh, partial removal of subsidy 
and following the uh, floating of exchange rate. So those two, energy and FX, it's likely to be more, uh, having more impact on inflation for now. Yeah. That's what we think. Uh, but then we think that money supply growth, if you say too much money chasing fuel growth, right. it's a basic definition. People exactly. say, naturally say maybe it's inflationary. Yeah. Right? But we think that uh, there's not a greater role for FX and then energy just because of the policy shift. Mm. Right? But then the base effect right, is likely to be very strong. So much so that uh, a lot of that impact should be offset. Fantastic. Phil, less than a minute to go. The last chart here, I could go, we could spend the rest of the day on the charts from this report. Equities, uh, looks like Nigerian NGX outperforming some of its peers. What's the equity play for the second half of the year as far as Nigerian stocks are concerned? Yeah, that's the, for those that are looking, the purple line that is at the highest level, that's Nigeria versus everyone, at least others compared. What's, what's the look? What's the equity play? Yeah, in terms of equity play, uh, we lean uh, more or less to fundamentals, yeah. right? Strategically, we think the macros uh, favor upstream oil and gas. Okay, so like right? a seplat. Like seplat. Yeah. We think the macros favor them. And of course, there also is also a tactical element for seplat, the mm. MPN New Deal. Right. And then we think that the overall, the mix of uh, the environment also favors banks, right? The recapitalization is likely to boost the, uh, their performances over the medium term. Yeah. Even though uh, people have sort of overreacted and selling banks, and we think that those sell-offs have actually created opportunity. Buying opportunities. Buying opportunities. Yeah. What we think is, with recapitalization, their interest earning asset base grows, and in an environment with elevated interest rates, those interest in earning assets will be deployed to high yielding opportunities. Gotcha. Yeah. You know, they will tie down uh, those opportunities, decent rates, and their performances are likely to to be good. Yeah. So it's, it's one to be looking at. Then, of course, we also like uh, stocks that have a mix of three characteristics. One is low leverage. Of course, when uh, the interest rate environment is high, you want to go for stocks that, are, that have low leverage because mm. of uh, the impact of finan on finance costs. Yeah. Then we like stocks uh, with um, uh, low or more manageable net FX exposure. Okay. Of course, FX is uh, well, talked about central. the impact. And then the third one? robust cash uh, position. So uh, on, in that bucket, we see fitting stocks like Transcorp. We see fitting stocks like USC and Unilever. Yeah. We like um, Okomo Oil yeah. as well, and a few other ones. Philip Anegbe, Vice President, Head of Investment Research at Cardinal Stone Partners. Fantastic report. Thanks for your time. Really appreciate you coming. <laughs>